Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Secret sky cameras record your city's every move. Plus some good news about bad banksters. But first, pharma firm Mylan faces scrutiny over 548% price increase on the EpiPen. Mylan became the latest pharmaceutical company to face popular outrage about higher drug costs as attacks mounted on the company's substantial price increases for the EpiPen emergency allergy treatments. EpiPen is a life-saving treatment for millions whose allergies can send them into severe shock, including many school children who are advised to keep an injector handy at all times. A pack of two lists for $608.61. That's up 548% since Mylan began selling the drug in late 2007. Mylan's 17 different price increases during that nearly decade-long span include two since a major competitor was recalled late last year, and they've emerged as the newest flashpoint in public scrutiny of drug costs. Both Democrats and Republicans have leveled criticism, and some called for investigations, which is all well and fine if it weren't for the pesky, nearly omnipresent conflict of interest and corruption coming from both phony sides of the Congress critters. And so, James, like a lot of stories I imagine people out there see on a sidebar, you'll see words and they kind of, you note it in the background, but you haven't yet taken the moment to pay attention. We are bombarded with information. We have to kind of keep our wits about us and not just dive into any kind of information that flies our way. And I had seen the story about the EpiPens and just logged it under, okay, big pharma gouging prices, just like Shkreli and, and the previous pharma gouging. But then I caught the headline that, of course, rocketed it home to me, James. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin mum on EpiPen price hikes by Daughters Drug Corps. U.S. Senator Joe Manchin remained mum on Wednesday, that's today, August 24th, as I come to you, as pharmaceutical company run by his daughter faced mounting criticism for hiking prices on life-saving allergy injection pens. The Democratic West Virginia Senator's daughter, Heather Bresch, is CEO of Mylan, the manufacturer of EpiPens. Manchin's silence contrasted with a growing number of leaders crying foul on the ballooning prices, including fellow senators and even the presidential candidate that Manchin has endorsed, Hillary Clinton. Now the full circle punchline from the Daily Caller. The company gouging prices on EpiPens is a Clinton Foundation donor and partner since 2009. So this brings it back, and I had the phrase in my head as I was prepping the notes, Rockefeller medicine. This goes back a long time, and the Rockefellers have had sort of a soft control over my home state of West Virginia for many a generation. And what do I see only just a few weeks ago? The former senator of West Virginia, Jay Rockefeller, as he's popularly known, that's John D. Rockefeller IV, he wrote an op-ed for the West Virginia Gazette Mail, Hillary looking fearlessly at West Virginia's future. So in addition to all of those links and notes, which we will always include down in the show notes, we'll also include the flashback to your episode, Rockefeller Medicine, the real history of modern healthcare. So again, for what just looked like another headline of big pharma gouging, which we've come to expect, like a lot of situations, you drill below the headlines and you see that it's probably going to hit you where you live, James. Well, it shouldn't be surprising. I mean, it's almost as if there's something skewing the uh, the healthcare markets in the United States. Could it be the collusion between government and corporations and insurance companies and doctors and all of the people who stand to make money from the gouging? Maybe it could. And from that Wall Street Journal article, although spending on prescription medic- medicines accounts for less than a fifth of overall healthcare costs, higher drug prices have become a lightning rod especially as many patients choose insurance with higher deductible or coinsurance to limit monthly premiums. Now, are, are many patients choosing that, or are they being forced into it by Obamacare? But whatever the case may be, uh, I would just hope that people can take a step back and look at this from an historical perspective, because it is not the case that government was always involved in, in mandating health care and, uh, and structuring the, uh, the, the health care insurance as the only possible way that we could possibly imagine health care being provided to people, including poor people. Oh, wait, no, of course not. I'm going to direct people to an excellent video about that history and about how the changeover from people 
banding together voluntarily to provide uh, healthcare services to it being state mandated. It's a video called How Government Solved the Healthcare Crisis. And it uh, puts this very, very, very succinctly, very wonderfully, and basically tells the story of how we went from a society where mutual aid societies were providing uh, healthcare to poor workers at absolutely low cost rates, a day's worth uh, worth of work could uh, provide for a year's worth of health insurance because doctors were scrambling, competing to try to get contracts with different fraternal societies. But then the state comes in and starts to mandate and license and uh, regulate uh, the healthcare industry and problem solved for the doctors who weren't making enough money and the, the insurance companies who get to come up and make their billions and trillions by being connected to the right political insiders. It is a scam, top to bottom, and the less that people know about that history, the more likely they are to be taken in by the scam. It is it is the disease industry. James, I was enjoying going back through Rockefeller Medicine and learning things. I, I must have I, I slept on that when you put that out a few years ago, learning about even just sort of the weaponization of the term quack was just someone who actually wasn't licensed in, in the gangster kind of setup. So this story about big pharma gouging and as it connects directly to West Virginia politics is, of course, a story I'm going to continue to follow on Media Monarchy as actually legislation's just been introduced in West Virginia for medical marijuana. I do not hold my breath that it will pass, but in a lot of ways I see my home state as that kind of place sort of stuck between that rugged individualism and willingly, constantly working and voting against its own best interest. So we'll include show notes for that as well, James. Amazing piece put together by Bloomberg. It is as whiz-bang with video and graphics, and and it's quite the thing to behold. The only thing that's maybe more impressive is the story itself. Secret sky cameras record Baltimore's every move, and the story was broken by Bloomberg, And now, of course, Baltimore police are defending an aerial surveillance program used to investigate crimes in the city, saying characterizing it as a secret is inaccurate. Bloomberg first reported the program late last night, Tuesday night, August 23rd. It was never disclosed publicly. Since the beginning of the year, the Baltimore Police Department has been using a plane to investigate crimes ranging from property thefts to shootings. Baltimore spokesman... T.J. Smith defended the program in a news conference, denying that it was being kept secret from Baltimore residents, sort of saying, it's not a secret. We just never told you about it. Sort of like the, what the Masons aren't a secret society. They're a society with secrets. So the semantics and word games are quite interesting. But they, James, I mean, they tested it in Iraq. So just like they test the sound wave cannons and test all the other weapons literally of war, as we've always said over the course of a decade, They're testing them out there so they can bring them home here, and they're flying around overhead. Indeed. Well, these stories, like this thorough Bloomberg report that you point out, are, I I think they serve a dual purpose. One is as a type of advertising for the company that's doing this, Persistent Surveillance Systems, which gets a nice advertising, a full, in-depth advertisement for their services. Um, which pays off because they note in this about the Radio Lab radio show that they did last year on this same company actually led to this company getting new contracts. So one can imagine this Bloomberg uh, article will have the same effect. But secondarily, this is kind of an advertising for the idea because Newsflash, the technology exists It is already being used on people without them knowing it. It is coming to a city near you. And, uh, I mean, just try and stop it. It is going to be used by more and more police departments. And this is a way to introduce it to the public. And, of course, they introduce it in the kind of hand-wringy way. Oh, here's this excellent, wonderful technology that'll solve all crimes. But, yeah, it's a bit of a privacy bummer, I guess. So, and here's a privacy advocate. One of those strange privacy advocates, you know, like a normal human being who has some concerns about it. But look at what it can do. It's so amazing. Um, And that's the way that this this type of story functions. Ultimately, it's just introducing the public to the idea and getting them used to it. And it's and like you said, it's a fantastic commercial for for persistent surveillance. And in a lot of situations, they hit you on the human interest story. How could you deny using technology when it's been proven to show we caught that guy who shot those people? 
So they're able to have these couple of bits of success. I- I'll go one step further. Why don't they just put a camera in everybody's home? Why don't they just monitor literally everything and just everyone openly give it to the government be- so then the government can save us all from everything? Well, I think the ACLU guy in one of the clips, and, and again, some of these show notes will include some of the videos from local Baltimore news agencies, because, of course, when this story breaks, all your local Baltimore news are going to go, holy crap, they're spying on us, too. Not only are they killing us, but they're spying on us as well. All our suspicions prove prove out. You'll find in those videos, I, I think, the other things that we're kind of talking about here. One of the ACLU guys says, we decided, you know, we weren't going to be that that kind of society that wanted to put cameras in all of our homes, so we're going to have to fight this. And again, that, unfortunately, is the strongest voice fighting this kind of thing. So there is that Radio Lab episode from 2015 called Eye in the Sky. There's even a more recent article, Crime Sensing Microphones, Hearing and Locating Gunshots. We've been reporting on that for you for a while as well. And one little extra interesting note, Baltimore hired and fired a neo-Nazi lawyer to defend the police department. Like a lot of situations, sometimes public relations moves can blow up in your face. You don't exactly know what you're getting into, which brings us to our third and final story this week. On New World Next Week, episode 281, the Federal Reserve's Facebook PR disaster. Of course, the Federal Reserve, known for its secrecy, but in an attempt to reach out to the people it claims to serve, the monolithic bank created a Facebook page and might be regretting that decision. Unlike Twitter, where the Fed decides which comments to reply to and therefore which show up publicly on its page, its feed, its public Facebook page, launched just a week ago, is not as restrictive. In fact, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System page has been relentlessly trolled since it went up. They report a bunch of these in the article. My favorite one, James, is the goal of the Federal Reserve is to make their friends rich at the expense of the common worker through slow and steady inflation under the guise of providing stability and low employment. They want to be your friend on Facebook, though. (laughs) I don't know. I love these. So we've talked about a lot of these. So it was hashtag my NYPD when organizations that are hated try and dip their toe into the social media sphere it's very heartening for a you know news curmudgeon like myself to see that. there was another one actually recently the dea the drug enforcement agency they have a twitter account and as they note at the top it sort of says you know this this account is just for posting news and we don't actually monitor it so when the news was posted that they of course are still down with the drug war the tweets of just people spewing anger at them and i think a lot of that came from the note that well we're not actually monitoring this account so it's like oh so people feel like you're not monitoring it so they can tell you that they hate you however maybe uh the fed is monitoring their facebook page and all the people registering their hate they're all going on a facebook list Look, the the greatest trick that the oligarchs have ever pulled is to convince people, to really convince the vast majority of people that no one thinks like you. You're a weirdo. You're kind of out on the side. You know, you're one of the very, very few people who knows or cares about these issues. Most people don't care. And most people are, you know, dumbed down sheeple and all of that kind of uh, rhetoric. And it, it pits people against each other. It makes people feel weak and powerless. And, oh, I'm, you know, there's only a few of us out there. Newsflash, that is not the case. There are many, many, many more people out there who are awake and aware than you would expect. And every time there is anything resembling a fair fight in the online space for uh, hearts and minds, it's proven time and time and time again. The truth uh, is truly popular it, in, and well-known and well-understood. That's why YouTube had to remove their f- uh, front page because you had truth documentaries trending every single day. It's why Google Video had to move their top 10 off of the front page into a sidebar and then ultimately get rid of it. And then they had to get rid of Google Video altogether. It's why Facebook m- manipulates their newsfeed and suppresses certain items. It's because they are afraid of people learning that there are more people out there who actually 
actually know and care and understand the truth than uh, than they would like you to believe. So don't believe their lies. There are more people out there who understand this than you would expect, and uh, they want you to feel like you're alone and that you shouldn't talk about this because everyone will think you're crazy. The exact opposite is the case. You should talk about this more often and uh, and be open about it to show other people that they can be open about it too, and you will be surprised how many people agree with you. You know, the, for me, that was always about being myself in doing media monarchy because even at the time in launching this in the middle of the 2000s we would have thought that the george bush goons were going to kick down our door and martial law oh my god i always felt like it was important to be me james evan Pilato. if i believe all this because i've done the research why would i want to hide or lie who i am now i can't deny other people for all their other different reasons why they might want to maintain their anonymity and that is totally up to them but for me yeah, it's always been about no i'm me i'm james evan Pilato, west virginia kid who likes to get into news and information this is who i am and i'm only going to kind of put that out more and more and as you note the truth is popular as the view count for last week's episode of new world next week shows we were kind of joking off mic a little bit. I glanced earlier and kind of did the double take. Last week's episode on the Soros hack was huge, and so for people who have maybe joined us again for only the second week, huge big tent welcome. We don't fall into the fear mongering, and this is you know true independent alternative media. And my extra thing I would say about Facebook, I deactivated my Facebook page over a week ago, and guess what happens? My website hits just keep going up. So in other good news, I published the latest episode of Good News Next Week, the spinoff from this New World Next Week series, where I try and highlight some of the ways that we are winning. Feeding the needy with Olympics excess, an Italian chef using tons of waste from the Olympics to actually feed people who need it. Plus stories about jailbreaking freedom and divesting from G-Force are some of the good news stories. And just a couple of New World Next Week headlines. Most State Department meet and greets with Hillary resulted in Clinton Foundation donations. And pretty stunning, I mentioned this on my morning show this morning, the United Nations admits to releasing cholera in Haiti, killing 10,000 people. So I do a live morning monarchy broadcast every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time and been making listener-supported media since 2005. And early on, I was lucky enough to hook up with James Corbett, and we've been making a weekly show for almost seven years, and what you see is what you get. We are what we say we are. There's no bells and whistles. There's no ads. There's no subterfuge to any of this, James, and I think the proof is in the pudding in a lot of what we do, and it's my pleasure to be able to do this with you week in, week out. Me too, and uh, don't forget the punchline to that UN Haiti story, which is, what do we need to solve this problem? More UN involvement in Haiti! Yay! Yeah, and so it goes. Anyway, the truth is popular. There are more people out there who uh, who appreciate it than you might realize. So help spread this the word about this program around and any other truthful information that you encounter online. We'll leave it there for this week. James Evan Pilato, thank you for the three stories. Thanks, buddy.